Hello everyone, so I'm Teddy. I currently work as a software developer at uh, Open Metadata, where we're building an open source metadata uh, catalog management uh, to basically discover your data set, apply some sort of governance and whatnot. And I previously worked in different data roles, so data analyst, data engineer. It's my first time speaking, first time ever at a Python conference, and uh, yeah, I'm a bit nervous. Um, so disclaimer, I'm not necessarily uh, directly involved with the well, Pydentic library, but I've just used it in different contexts, and I think it's an amazing library for a specific use case, and I just want to share the love and my experience with, uh, with everyone. Uh, so first we'll go over why Pydentic exists, go through some fair, uh, basics and elements of Pydentic, see cool features, uh, and then we'll go over two use cases that uh, I came through in my uh, experience. Um, so first of all, why do we need Pydentic? So as probably most of you know, Py Python is a dynamically typed language, uh, which means that this kind of uh, function where we are expecting to send well, two values uh, can be successfully run by passing two, two strings, right? Um, and so what you will end up with will be concatenating two screen and create two string and creating a new string when you were actually expecting to uh, return a specific integer, right? Um, and so a few years back, well, Python introduced some uh, static type type checkers such as MyPy that allows you to run your entire well, code base through specific type checking and make sure that you don't have uh, some quirks in your code. So in that example, if we run MyPy on our small application, then we see that um, our second call to some value is not correct as we're passing two string instead of uh, passing integers, right? Uh, so it, in certain contexts, that well, feature of Python is, is really, really great, right? Because it allows you to do well, quick experimentation and whatnot. But in certain contexts, uh, it can be more dangerous as you can pass some unexpected data into your application, process it, and do things that, you know, well, you didn't want to do. Um, and so that's where Pydentic comes to the rescue, right? By providing you a way to uh, type check your application, your code at runtime, and, and prevent it from processing uh, any further done your application. Uh, so basically, well, Pydentic, it allows you to um, enforce type hints at, at runtime. It's super easy to define your data representation using simple uh, Python code. You can also do more complex and modular stuff uh, by defining types as other Pydentic models. So we'll see that uh, a little bit uh, uh, further in the presentation. And you can also define your own types, define your own custom uh, uh, validation by, you know, if your application needs to validate against certain business logic, then you can, you can do that. Um, if we were to rewrite our previous function uh, using Pydentic, uh, we would simply define what is called well, a, a, a base model, basically, uh, which is represented here by my data where we're defining the types of our uh, two class attributes, so num1 and num2. Um, and then we would just pass those uh, uh, values from our uh, one class instance, basically, which is my data and my other data here, to our function. And then as we can see, uh, when we're trying to actually um, create an instance of my data with uh, two strings for the uh, uh, class attribute, then um, we see that Pydentic throws an error and it will stop the, the, the processing um, of our application. And we're not going further than our application and we're sure that we're not writing any bad data into um, our application. Um, so what we'll go over is the basic of uh, Pydentic models and some interesting future as well, um, but a small caveat with, with uh, Pydentic models. Um, 
So as we saw, to define a Pydentic model, it simply inherits from uh, what that base model class, and we just create a new uh, a new object where we are going to define some class attributes uh, and add some specific type hints to our class attribute. Um, models themselves, you can use them as um, as, a, as type in, in other Pydentic model, which allows you to create a more uh, modular uh, what type of model. So a good example is if you have uh, employees that belongs to a department, a department that belongs to an organization, you can create three different types of Pydentic models. Um, and in your employee model, you can simply uh, assign a, create a um, department class attribute that will have uh, as a type your department. So in this example here, we're doing it with the data property model that we are passing to my data. Um, in my data, we have a property properties class attribute, which has a type of data properties, which is itself a Pydentic model. So that allows you to define uh, complex models that are modular and can be reused um, in different parts of your of your code, basically. Um, so as we saw earlier, you can easily access uh, the values of your uh, object instance by simply calling the, the, uh, the attribute. One thing that is uh, that you need to be careful with, uh, that you need to be aware of, I guess, is data casting. Uh, so by default, Pydentic will cast uh, well, value as, um, as it is bit, basically. Um, so in um, in our first example, so we have our my data. Uh, we, we we define a new instance of my data, uh, which is the model that we've defined earlier. Uh, and instead of passing two integers, we are passing a string integer, and then a actual integer. And as we can see, when we run it, um, when we look at the type of my data num one attribute, uh, then we can see that Pydentic casted that value as a, from a string to an integer, right? So it's something that you need to, to be aware of. And if it's something that you really don't want, you can use a strict integer in that example. So it, Pydentic has a bunch of uh, strict data type that you can use to enforce a well, strict type checking and prevent Pydentic from um, casting your types uh, on the fly, basically. Um, Something that is pretty interesting as well. So as you saw before, we uh, define our data model ahead of time, right? By define by creating those uh, subclass of the base model object. Uh, but you can sometimes, maybe sometimes, you will need to create uh, dynamic models, so models that will be defined somewhat on the fly. Uh, and so. Pydentic allows you to do that uh, with that uh, create model uh, function. And basically what you need to pass is a, well, the name of your model as the first uh, argument. And then you will need to pass um, basically the type and the name of the value. So in that case, we can imagine that we're reading some sort of input from a YAML file that we can convert into a Python dictionary. And then from that YAML file, just defining our dynamic model and then just passing uh, those data into our object uh, and then creating our, our dynamic model. Uh, so that's pretty interesting feature if you need to, if you don't necessarily know ahead of time what your uh, data representation will, will look like. Um, the feature as well that uh, we, we've used often um, is the ability to uh, instantiate and uh, create an instance of your uh, of your class by parsing uh, an object. So it's a similar scenario where you can have a YAML file, for example, that has a different configuration that you can read, uh, um, transform into a, a Python dictionary. And then from that dictionary, by calling the uh, parse subject method on your Pydentic model, 
and passing that data, then you will create a new instance of that object that you can then use throughout, um, throughout your code. Um, one cool feature uh, is the ability to define custom data, uh, data type. So your data, your, the data type that you are assigning to your attribute don't necessarily need to be uh, Python primitive, but they can, be, they can also be your own uh, logic, basically. Uh, and for that, it's very simple, actually. Uh, you just need to define a validation method. So in that case, uh, we are from line six to uh, line 15, we are simply defining what a correct French phone number should look like. Uh, and then in our uh, get validator uh, dunder method, then we're simply yielding a uh, validator. And what's pretty cool is that you, you don't, you're not restricted to defining one validator, but you can, if you want, uh, define multiple validators and then just pass it to that get validator um, dunder method. And now when we are defining our Pydentic model, we can simply assign that French phone uh, class as a type of our phone uh, class attribute. Uh, and so that brings us to our second big topic, which are the Pydentic uh, validators. Um, Pydentic validators are a way for you to um, uh, validate against specific business logic, right? So, so far what we saw is validation against specific type, which is basically making sure that um, the, um, well, when you instantiate your object, that the value you are passing to, uh, well, your class are matching, match the type that you've defined, right? But sometimes in your data processing or other application, you may want to validate against specific business logic that pertain to your use case, right? Um, a good example could be making sure that age is greater than zero. Uh, could be making sure that the value, the amount of your order is greater than zero uh, to make sure that you're not, well, ingesting bad, bad, um, bad data, basically. Um, and to do so, you simply uh, use the validator decorator um, the, oh, sorry, the validator decorator uh, that you are going to, to, to add to your method inside your model. So in that case right here, we've created a identic user model uh, that has well, a few class attribute with a few uh, type int assigned. And then what we want to make sure is that age is never, uh, is always greater than zero, right? And seems like a, a fair thing to, to assume. Um, and then when we are going to run, uh, to create our um, object instance, if age is less than zero, then Pydentic will throw an error and then it will uh, raise that error and then it allows you to well, handle it uh, as you wish. Um, one thing to note with validators is when you are, uh, when you have a, uh, well, list or dictionary or set type in one of your uh, class attributes. Uh, if you don't set the each item um, um, uh, argument uh, of the validator method to true, uh, Pydentic will validate against the actual list object and not against the item inside that list, right? If you set it to true, then Pydentic will do the validation against each item of your basically container se sequence or, or whatnot. So it's a, a small element that uh, might be important to, to keep in mind. Um, and then the last interesting feature about Pydentic is the setting management. Um, basically what it allows you to do, it allows you to read uh, specific values from environment variable um, and it allows you to set uh, your configuration um, well, in an easy manner. And so that's a generally, uh, well, it's, it's generally interesting when you want to do some sort of overriding of your configuration uh, in, your, in your CI, basically. Um, so it's very similar to defining a base model, but in that case, the object inherits from the base settings. 
uh, you are still defining uh, your type as you would do with a regular, um, with a regular model. And then you are assigning uh, specific default values. Uh, the two interesting things are uh, what's under the class comfy, where you can define an environment prefix or if it's case sensitive or not. The environment prefix basically will be uh, appended to all of the class attributes uh, that you've defined uh, well, in your object. And so in that case, you can see that we have a port uh, class attribute. And when we are defining on line 15, the uh, actual environment variable, we're prefixing it with the pydentic underscore underscore um, as since we set that as the environment prefix. Uh, and you can see that in the example, uh, well, that, that value will be overwritten once we call uh, our setting again after we have defined that environment variable. Um, so if you use uh, .m file, then you can also pass that uh, in the class config, and then Pydentic will know where your uh, uh, .m file is located. Uh, one important thing is the value priority, so how uh, Pydentic determines uh, which value takes precedence over which one. Um, so whatever is passed um, as an argument will take precedence over everything, uh, which is pretty interesting when you have some sort of uh, a CI that needs you know, to, to have some specific configuration values or whatnot. Um, okay, so now uh, the, the two use cases. Uh, the first one, the first use case uh, that I've encountered uh, is well, when we are defining a DAG configuration file. And so for those of you who don't know, uh, DAG files are just a directed acyclic graph that defines uh, what well, task to be performed within a data pipeline. And so what, we, what we've tried to do is to make, to, 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 to give the ability uh, to people really close to the business domain to create their, to produce their, their own data pipeline to extract and transform, um, and transform data. The way we've done that is by building a pretty big over, overlay that's abstracting a lot of the steps that are required to uh, well, create Airflow, uh, Airflow DAGs basically. Uh, so that user just need to fill out a YAML configuration file and not worry about how to write that DAG file, what, you know, what's even Python or whatnot. They just need to know how to fill out that configuration file and then they're good to go. The uh, only drawback or the, the risk uh, with that is if a, or the, yeah, if a user uh, enter, creates a YAML configuration file that is not configured correctly, you can you run into the, the risk of either their pipeline doesn't work, now you have to well, debug it and understand what's going on, or worst case scenario, it breaks your entire Airflow instance, and well, that's not great because then you know all your data pipelines stop, and then your stakeholders are not uh, very happy. Uh, so what we've done, we've created some data contracts uh, that were defined using Pydentic models that were representing what a configuration file uh, should should be and what it's represent, what are the values that are allowed and, and whatnot. And then whenever a user makes a, a pull request, then we're able to validate their configuration file against what we are expecting to be a correct uh, YAML configuration file. And we don't need to worry about, you know, either manually checking it or having uh, their, well, their YAML configuration breaking or or Airflow instance. Um, then the second use case, which is uh, what we currently use uh, at Open Metadata, um, is to define uh, Pydentic models uh, using JSON schemas. Uh, so for those of you who don't know what JSON schemas are, JSON schemas are basically, well, JSON files that you annotate with uh, specific, um, specific values. Uh, so it has the benefit of being langu language and agnostic, super easy to read, uh, and it allows you to, to run some validation and testing um, against it. And so why we are using that kind of uh, approach, it's basically, um, we, we are defining uh, some 
uh, standard for metadata entity. So what we define, uh, what, what a table uh, entity should be, what kind of attribute it should have, what kind of characteristic it should have. And those entities are implemented across, across um, free code implementation. So we have the backend in Java, we have the front end in TypeScript, and then we have, we have the ingestion framework that's written in Python. And so the, the big question is how can we ensure that all of this implementation follow the same uh, data structure, right? And so the answer is simply by using, well, as you guess it, JSON schemas. Um, and the way we are generating those Pydentic models is by using a, well, a library, which is called data model called generator. Uh, and we are basically running this uh, data model called generator against our JSON schema. And those JSON schema will output Pydentic models that we can then use to validate different aspects of our code base, right? So uh, be an API payload or, uh, 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 sorry, or what the table entity representation should be, uh, all of this kind of thing. And we only write well, one centralized file and then it gets propagated across three different code base. Um, and yeah, so that's, Pretty much is for me. Thank you very much for the interesting talk. Um, are there any questions? If so, could you please come uh, to the front and um, ask it through the microphone so that the online audience can hear it as well? And just to the online audience, if you have any questions, please ask. Um, but we also. Let's integrate you as well. Thank you. Hi. Uh, you've shown us how validators work when you instantiate uh, a new object. Can you also uh, run validators when you change an attribute of an existing instance? Uh, can you... Like you, uh, you have an object mm -hmm. and you do object dot attribute equals something. Make sure that this also runs the validator. I see. Uh, that's a very good question. Actually, I will have to uh, double check with you. Uh, double check and then get back. <laughs> sorry, and then get back to you. But that's a very good question. So you mean basically changing the value of an attribute by simply accessing that attribute of that object, not yeah. instantiating that actual object. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I will have to to confirm okay. with you. Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, okay, I have a question okay. to you. <laughs> um, uh, so if I have a custom type hint, um, so like a nested type hint, would this also work with Pydentic? Uh, what do you mean by uh, Like I have a dictionary of a dictionary of a string and then maybe a custom something inside, like nested JSON structure, for example. Uh, yes, it's uh, uh, things that we use uh, in, uh, in our code base implementation. Okay. You can you also define optional um, uh, type hints, and then it will, um, well, you know. No one else? Ah, there we go. <laughs> um, so I think most of the things you were shown in the use cases were kind of take it, going from external data into your, into your code and making sure the validation from like external data in Yes. And I know Fast API uses it internally in the code to make sure that um, everything's working kind of internally in the code. What are the advantages that uh, Pydantic gives gives you, like you internally in the code, um, rather than something like a, a data class or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I guess something that we currently use and that you would be more taking internal data yeah. uh, is when we are defining the payload for our well, to pass to our uh, different API endpoint, where we are validating that uh, that payload is correctly formatted, and that it can be sent to uh, well, our backend API to write uh, specific entities or or whatnot. So that's the the the, the internal use case that uh, that we have right now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So I'm very new to Pydantic, but about the, your last slide about writing your schema in a JSON file mm -hmm. and loading them into different programming languages. 
I was thinking like what would be the advantage of using Pydantic Py over something like Portobuf. Porto so uh, yeah, that's the, that's the question. Yeah. Well, th <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, I've mainly just experimented with uh, either plain uh, data classes or Pydantic. I not super familiar with uh, with that library. Uh, but what the advantage currently is that the code generator uh, what plugin is able to output those identity classes, um, and so that's you know mainly why we have uh, we have that direction. Hey, how's it going? Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, would you use Pydantic with data frames like pandas or is there? Um, I'm trying to think. Um, so we, it, I, we, I haven't personally had the, the, the use case. Um, generally, the way we are, we've been using it is to, well, when we are consuming data from a specific endpoint or consuming data from a, a config file, then making sure that uh, that data representation uh, is what we are expecting. Uh, and then if we then need to do some processing or whatnot, then we can uh, transform that specific data into, uh, into a, a, a Python data frame. Uh, but using it directly with, uh, with pandas, uh, I, I haven't come across that, uh, that specific use case. Uh, thank thanks. you for the question. Thanks for the talk. Uh, maybe just a quick one. Is there, in your experience, any time when a data class would be better over Pydantic? Yeah, so um, I guess, well, that's a good question. The, um, well, the reason that we, the, the nice thing, I guess, about Pydantic is the way that it's um, uh, handling um, uh, mutable default types. Uh, so if I want to remember in data classes when you are defining a, well, creating a, a, a mutable uh, attribute, it will throw an error. Uh, in Pydantic, it, it, um, it handles that automatically by creating deep copy of that uh, mutable attribute on each uh, instantiation of this, of, of this object. Uh, so that's, that's the, the biggest advantage that I found over, over data classes. Yeah. We would have time for one more question. <laughs> All right, then thank you very much for the talk. It was... Uh...